Are you ready for the full spectrum dominance of planet Earth? Let's enter the buzzsaw. Central Intelligence Agency. It was described by witnesses as... Alana Freeland is joining us today from uh, Washington State. She's written a book, a fascinating book, called Chemtrails, Harp, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. And she'll be discussing more of what that actually means as we unpack a lot of information here. Alana, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sean. So I just want to start out by, first of all, this, 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 this coined phrase, full spectrum dominance. I know I've heard it before as a doctrine. I think it's a neocon doctrine. But can you describe a little bit of what the full spectrum dominance refers to and where you got that uh, verbiage from? Well, the term refers to a doctrine, a military doctrine, that has um, came on board actually with the uh, what's called the Revolution in Military Affairs, the RMA, of the 90s. And um, your relating it to the neocons is very interesting because actually, uh, as people have slowly awakened to who the sitting president really is and who he serves, uh, we we really have never left what happened in 1980 with uh, the the uh, bogus uh, Iran Contra uh, hostage affair election of what I call the the Troika, Ronald Reagan, uh, George H W Bush, and Dick Cheney as Secretary of Defense. So. Um, that's when the Star Wars program started, the SDI, the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, in a way, it's never left. We were told, as usual, that it had been tabled for lack of funds or whatever, and that simply was not true. Uh, President Clinton renamed it. He, too, was one of theirs, just as this Democratic sitting president is one of theirs. And so we really never have left... Uh, 1980 in many ways, but much has happened in those, uh, I guess, now 40 years. So uh, when I chose the title uh, for Full Spectrum Dominance, I had it, I thought of it as two tiers. The first tier is obvious, Full Spectrum Dominance, meaning uh, revolution in military affairs, asymmetric warfare. We're now in a whole different ball game in warfare ever since the discovery of all that can be done with electromagnetics. So uh, that has um, been the way it is. Uh, and the second tier is, to me, even more crucial for people to understand, and that is uh, that it means the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. So full spectrum dominance, C4, is another term used, bandied about by the military. That's command, control, communications, and cyber warfare. Uh, the the C4 domination of the electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from radio waves to gamma ray, rays. And so <clears throat> if you look at it, uh, our little band on the spectrum is just so tiny. What we can see, what we can perceive with our five senses. Uh, but there is so much more. And that is my hope is <clears throat> when I wrote the book, I wanted to, first of all, kill forever the ridiculous idea that chemtrails uh, is a, um, a conspiracy theory. I also wanted to show how chemtrails and HARP work together and how they each need each other. And when I say HARP, uh, I have to clarify that that was the uh, uh, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project up in Gakona, Alaska. Yes, a, a, an amazing uh, instrument which uh, claimed to be researching the ionosphere. And uh, as everyone probably knows who listens to your show, that was purportedly shut down in about 2012, 2013. Uh, the truth is, yes, it was shut down, but only to be retooled. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, the, the power that HARP was able to uh, to exhibit uh, on the uh, ionosphere, oh, very unfortunate now, our ionosphere probably looks like a piece of Swiss cheese after uh, those years of HARP. However, um, 
it is not going to be used for that anymore. The experiments were very successful for the military. They were able to see um, how they should conduct their other agendas. And now we have um, ionospheric heaters all over the world. In fact, not just stationary. We have them on uh, their mobile. And we have uh, NEXRADs, um, uh, radar installations on military bases galore around the world. So what is really being set up now with the Chemtrails HARP instrumentality, which is a global instrument, not to think Alaska anymore, what we have is uh, a space fence. This is another Reagan, uh, Bush, Cheney, Troika idea. We had the space fence before. We were also told that was shut down. And uh, according to Billy Hayes, who's known as the Harp Man, and he's one of my very uh, special advisors, Billy crawled up on many of those towers, in fact, was head of the team that built the HARP installation, and, and then he also was involved in 250 other installations around the world uh, and is now retired. I guess you could say he's retired. Um, he explained how uh, this, uh, the HARP instrument can be now used completely as a directed energy weapon. Um, and the interesting thing about all of these global instruments is how do they work together? Well, they need that grid. They need a grid upon which to build their operations, whether they're weather operations or weather warfare, whatever they are, targeting of individuals, targeting of entire cities, entire small nations. They need a grid. And when we think grid, maybe uh, many people think, okay, uh, a phased array grid like HARP was. Uh, lots of, uh, of uh, heaters, and they're all sort of wired together. Or maybe we think uh, fiber optics, like the fiber opt optics cables that we have running under the oceans for our Internet. Or maybe they think, uh, have graduated to thinking wireless uh, grids. Yes, wireless grids. Those are waves, uh, uh, extra low frequency waves going long distances all the way around the planet and being able to be tweaked by different frequencies uh, with different pulses. Yes, now we're getting close to what we have here, but what was needed, what was essential to this space fence grid uh, and I call it a lockdown of the planet, was to ionize our atmosphere and keep it ionized. Now, an ionized atmosphere means it's battery ready. It's electric. It's ready to go for any military operation that there might be, including communications, but other things. Uh, so that's what the chemtrails have been so valuable for and are still valuable for. If you've looked up in the sky, you'll see. Though the pattern of distribution and delivery is differing. And a lot of us, uh, particularly people that I've chosen for my closed group on Facebook, we're all studying this to see what this new delivery system is. Yes, they're still laying the long trails that are filled with chemicals, uh, with, uh, with uh, conductive metals, uh, polymers like mylar, um, biological uh, agents that they're testing out, or maybe they've already tested them and they're using them on us, such as lithium. And that would include uh, rocket uh, uh, launches that leave behind masses of not just aluminum, but also chemicals of the day of whatever they've chosen to distribute in that particular area over a pretty big chunk of geography. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of that um, is, is going on, and we're still trying to uh, decide how they're doing different bits of geography around the planet. Mostly uh, my book covers NATO, NATO countries. I'm so sorry about my... I don't know why my computer is doing this. You can't see me, can you? No, we can see you fine. So, okay. Um, but you're, but so you're saying the connection, really, I'm, I'm, I'm missing the connection here between the chemtrails and the HARP, because you're saying, so the HARP yes. was designed to ionize the atmosphere. That's yes. the, that's the so intention what you of HARP. have is, it's, not just, it's just not just the ionizing of the ionospheric heaters. 
it's also the use of lasers and, and different type of beam weapons to stimulate those conductive metals. That's number one. Um, when you see a weather front uh, coming off of the South Pacific, say, say there's, uh, there's moisture, a uh, moisture system is, is running in, and this is kind of how weather works. The South Pacific is very much a generative uh, place. Well, the U.S. Navy is out there um, moving it along, but at the same time utilizing laser and, and other, uh, other beam weaponry to, uh, to guide it, sort of shepherd it along. As you know, California now is four years into a drought. Mm -hmm. So they get it up to almost the coast of California, the West Coast, and then you see that they're really hitting it with a lot of beam weaponry, and you can see this on various sites uh, that, are, that are satellite. And then they, they, sh they sort of move it north, uh, up along or Oregon coast and and the Washington coast, and what they're doing is they're they're denying California and Oregon, uh, mostly just the West Coast in general, denying uh, us the moisture. I've had I'm here in the Pacific Northwest. We haven't had any rain all summer. It's been hot, hot, hot. So they take that moisture north, and then they uh, they. Clip it in a way. Clip it onto uh, uh, the uh, jet stream that now dips down and then heads east. And at various junctures along that journey, as the jet stream now loaded with the moisture that should have naturally come in and sort of done a large swath of the west coast, they take that east, and then you have all these weather experiments going on in um, Kansas, in the Midwest, uh, in northern Texas, uh, down into the Gulf states, all the way to Florida. You have various, various strange weather incidents going on back east. That was all the way. We've been doing this for 16 years, but primarily, if you really watch this stuff, you'll see that, that the they have um, they have maybe a project. Maybe someone has their special project on their laptop with their monitor in Colorado or or uh, in Virginia, and they're um, they're watching how to do how to how to move this weather system. They've been learning. They've been practicing, mm -hmm. and all of this practice will be rewarded in December in Paris at the UN Climate Conference when it will be decided how the weather, and they're, they're going to call it global warming, right. uh, really they're going to call warfare. it climate change, mm -hmm. but really what's going to be decided is um, how this weather instrument that has now been practiced for 15 to 16 years, uh, all the way since it was called by the military project Cloverleaf, and now has had no name and has been hidden and all of us have been called conspiracy theorists who are noticing that our skies are not the same, our weather is not the same. All of this will be, uh, will decide who and how this instrument will be utilized. And um, if people have wondered all along why all the climate conferences heretofore have been pretty much ignored. All the things that they came up with, the cool ideas, there's been no teeth in the enforcement. This is why, because it is a weather instrument belonging to the military. Uh, I'm most familiar with the American military, of course, because I live here. Uh, but I know that other countries have been working on the same thing, and so there is obviously, as you look out into the news events of the day, a power shift is going on. And I see that primarily the power shift is going on around this, this very subject. And I didn't really realize that when I wrote the book. I, I more or less just wanted to consolidate what we knew, and there hadn't been a book out in several years. Um, uh, I had, let's see, Nick Begich and <clears throat> Gene Manning wrote a book back in 1995, Angels Don't Play This Harp. Mm -hmm. uh, then Jerry Smith wrote a couple, uh, Will Thomas wrote a book, uh, Cloud, 
I have it here. I can't remember the name. And then Jerry Smith wrote a book on harp and on weather warfare. And there had been nothing out uh, in about seven years. And so I, I just wanted to consolidate it all. I, I call it the meat and potatoes book. I don't think that it's a revelation to anyone who's been following all of this. But it needed to be in, the, in, in between the covers of a book instead of just on the Internet with all sorts of flagrant abuses of the subjects and, and jumping to wild conclusions and trolls. And I mean, it was a real crazy crazy house on the internet. So now, uh, the, the reason I've started uh, this next book, um, The Space Fence, I, I need to show people how far-ranging uh, this technology really is. It's not just about weather. Right. Well, that's, that was, that's, that's exactly my question. Is, yes. So you're saying it begins as weather warfare, but ultimately... What is? I mean, what, first of all, just in that in that sense, just to stick to that point, what would be the purpose of the weather warfare? As far as as you mentioned, the the conference around global warming and whatnot. What is the purpose of this weather warfare? Is it to if, affect crops and obviously be able to control uh, access to, to fresh water? I mean, that's obviously one aspect from a military point of view is food and water. Is that really what you think the weather warfare is about? Well, th that's a good beginning. I mean, that's that's very important. And um, I think you saw a few years ago, you've probably forgotten it, everything kind of falls down the memory hole. We're being inundated by uh, occurrences every day. But uh, I remember very well when Iran uh, had a drought that seriously uh, crippled the country a few, just three or four years ago. And uh, that was, uh, and they came right flat out and said it was weather warfare from the United States. Um, so it is a way to muscle countries into obedience. Uh, it is a way to threaten countries to go along with your your program. Um, it's also a way to make money, and that has to do with weather derivatives that actually started uh, back with Enron uh, in 2000. And um, anyone can buy into weather derivatives through the Chicago Mercantile Market, um, and it's a real a real con job. I mean, it's not about real money, but uh, the insiders who know about this technology and even know which way it's going to move against whom and when, uh, they can make a lot of money, and they have made a lot of money in the last decade and a half. So. It's another aspect to uh, disaster capitalism, and that's what we're in now. Thanks to Na Naomi Klein, who wrote The Shock Doctrine several years ago, uh, we now have a term for what we're seeing. We're seeing the creation of disasters to make money. Mm -hmm. And I, I think right away of poor New Orleans and Katrina. Mm -hmm. And I go into it deeply in the book of how that was, it was the Halliburtons of the world made, made a fortune off of that. Right. Um, and so, so there's an economic warfare going on um, in, in the sense of uh, a way to keep the American market afloat despite our trillions of dollars of debt. Um, there's a way that uh, other countries are looking at that and, and thinking the same thing because, um, as you know, we're, we're heading into uh, a, a solar cycle where there will be very little happening. And uh, most people don't know this, but the, uh, the stock market depends on solar cycles for, uh, for bear markets. So um, this, is, uh, this is probably a little scary for the, the big bucks guys, the 1% of the 1% who've made a fortune off of disaster so far. Mm -hmm. So to me, uh, when I heard that the Rothschilds were buying into, uh, they, they bought up uh, several of the weather reporting um, stations uh, and, uh, and others have uh, done the same. I, was, uh, I think it was... Uh, it was my favorite, Raytheon, which used to own a lot of the harp patents, by the way. Raytheon is, is uh, not what it seems. It probably should be spelled with the three letters of an intelligence agency. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, when I saw that they bought up the National Weather Service and do the reporting for NOAA, uh, and that Lockheed, Lockheed Martin forecasts modeling for the FAA, uh, I got the picture. 
Uh, and so they're getting ready. They've been getting ready for this uh, solar down uh, in order to keep the money flowing from disaster capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so those are some other things about the weather. Right. Those are what I think of. But then this then leads into the space fence concept, what they're doing as far as ionizing the ionosphere, which is to basically, as you said before, to basically create more of an electrical charge through it to, to then allow what? What kind of electromagnetic warfare you're talking about? Um, yes, uh, electronic warfare, EW, but, um, but more, more to the point, when Edward Snowden made the announcement of something I'd known for a decade was, it, was in place um, about the surveillance, um, that's really what the space fence is primarily about, surveillance. Now, mm. When you think surveillance, you probably think something along the lines of just so they know where everybody on Earth is at any given moment in case they want to access them or something like that. Yes, that's true. Also, this has to do with the mind control piece to be able to uh, really lock on to someone's brain at any given point. Um, and the the thing to remember about the military that is building this space fence is yes, it, it has to do with defense. I'm sure that the military minded will will see the sense in that. But more more to the point, uh, the paranoia the paranoia of the military mind is now going to reveal itself in in, in full bloom. Because um, they, they want to be able to uh, have access to anyone, anywhere, any place, anytime, uh, 24-7. And they don't want to go through all the planning sessions. So, uh, you know, the hours and hours of planning. And then, well, one of the things was, oh, suddenly now, uh, like when they... Um, they blew the uh, the a bomb off down in White Sands in 1945. They had to delay it several hours because uh, a wind came up. So they want to be able to control it from that very pragmatic level. But it's more than that. It's about AI. It's about mm -hmm. the role of artificial intelligence in the future world that is now being constructed, and. The AI that has come out recently is the Jade Helm 15, which uh, uh, I heard a really good video or two on uh, regarding how it is a, it will be a, yes, it's an exercise, an exercise uh, in using an AI program for a mass of data to decide on what needs to be done and to make those decisions, not just to see what needs to be done and then confer with human uh, generals but to actually make the decisions of what needs to be done on its own. So that's how I see the space fence. It will be a surveillance instrument uh, beyond belief, but uh, primarily they're going to go AI at a certain point with the space fence. And uh, this is a, you know, this is sort of a wet dream of, uh, of, of military generals for, for a long time. On the other hand, there are some very good human beings who are attempting to serve in the military that has been so swayed by the idea of um, an AI world a, a, and of humans being uh, enhanced uh, in the transhumanist singularity way mm -hmm. to become uh, partial machines, cyborgs. Um, so this, this idea is, has taken hold of our military. And um, I'm not sure how or I'm not sure how. Mm -hmm. uh, do, I, do I think that um, they've been um, hoodwinked by some powerful... AI in itself, some off-planet AI, uh, I really don't know. I mean, when I look at that electromagnetic spectrum and see how vast it is, I, I can only imagine the, the various uh, parallel dimensions and 
consciousnesses on those on those levels. Right. But I don't I don't write about that because I don't have any documentation. I don't have any backup to prove my point. But I I know that we are moving into a transhumanist uh, world, and um, and it will it will be. Uh, as as extreme as you can imagine. And I think that we're seeing many things. I mean, people comment on it all the time. Everything's happening so fast, mm -hmm. uh, so fast. I mean, uh, now uh, all states have to agree to gay marriages. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it isn't that I'm, you know, I'm not talking about gays here. I'm talking about the, the the way things are being done, the top down sort top of down, uh, pushing yes. of certain agendas. I think that the transgender thing is actually sort of an interesting step towards this, the transhuman idea, because obviously yes. that's, there's exactly. something there's any, something unisex about that concept. Any place you can erase what the Enlightenment taught us was human for the European uh, derivative people. Mm -hmm. Any place you can erase that idea of human. It is being done. Well, and that's why I have to bring in the idea of a possible AI in the sense of um, artifice, artificial intelligence, something non-human. Right. That's uh, I have artificial. to bring that in because it is happening at such an amazing pace. Yeah. I, I, feel, I feel swept up in this. And yet, am I uh, depressed or uh, no no I'm, I'm very excited to be uh, alive at, at such a tremendous transitional point that has all the uh, aspects of a spiritual warfare for uh, to maintain the human species is sort of the bottom line to me and why I work so hard and will, uh, you know, I'm now completely overwhelmed with way too much information uh, for the Space Fence book because the Space Fence has to do with everything. It has to do with, well, everything I've studied in order to write the Sub Rosa series and to write the Chemtrails Heart book. So I, I'm having to sort of pick my way through. Mm -hmm. And whereas in the Chemtrails Heart book, I was very careful to not totally leave myself as the author out, but, but I, I was pretty low-key. I, I, I pretty much uh, inundated people with 600 footnotes. Uh, in this book, I will be much more present because uh, I do, I feel this will be my last technical book. I, I, I've reached the end, unless I go and maybe get a PhD in plasma physics, which I'm not <laughs> going to do. Uh, and so I, I, I want to I want to put my two cents in there about what I see. I've tracked these guys, these globalists, for over 20 years now. I think I've walked in their uh, their Gucci shoes, and I know uh, how they think. And uh, and I I've studied brotherhoods, uh, fraternities uh, that are um, esoterically minded. I've followed the pedophiles. I've followed um, uh, the ways, of, the ways and byways mm -hmm. of the elite class in order to see what their thinking is uh, regarding the future of the earth. So I, I will make, uh, I, I will put comments in the book uh, just so. There's no doubt how, how I feel. Yeah. About well, let's this. talk about this, the space fence a little bit from the point of view of, I don't understand quite how the space fence will interact with the artificial intelligence concept. I mean, I, I definitely understand the, the concept of wanting to use electromagnetic warfare for mind control, because ultimately, beyond the surveillance state, there's actual the next evolution of, of surveillance, which is how do you actually manipulate people's trends. So you don't have to sit, simply sit there and monitor uh, people's behavior, right? The idea that Aaron Russo talked about when he, when he met with Nick Rockefeller at the CFR, Aaron Russo said, well, these guys want to be able to ultimately control human behavior. They want to be able to chip them or somehow control your, your buying patterns, your work patterns, right? Uh, every, all aspects of basically eliminating free will, right? So if that's, let's say, the goal, how, is this, how would the space fence fit into this sort of this mapping and uh, control structure? Well, Sean, I don't know about, I mean, I think that's already being done. Um, it's it's not particularly difficult to influence people and uh, 
trivialize their free will as to what brand of jeans they're going to buy. I think I think that's already happened, uh, and I think that that was studied uh, through uh, Edward Bernays of uh, the Cold War period after World War II. I think that the PhDs came in legions in sociology and psychology in order to see how best to use the instrument of television and, uh, and um, corporate media to do exactly what you said. I don't think that's a challenge anymore. I think it's a done deal. Now, why people like me uh, are not caught up in that, well, I was raised without television. I'm, I'm of a dying 60s generation. Uh, I was not conditioned early. I did not go to churches. Uh, my grandmother was a gypsy and uh, for aroma, and she, she, didn't, uh, she didn't believe in almost anything in America except she told me it was still the greatest country on earth, and I was conditioned to believe that at a certain point by a woman who had fled Romania uh, with the communist uh, well, well, pre-communism, but uh, terrible fascism, and and uh, and so she she really loved being here in that she could be free in her own home. Mm-hmm. I think that the way the space fence will play in is through frequency and pulses. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you know that if you, uh, I was watching a lovely little YouTube uh, of a young man who put a camera in his guitar. And then started playing a tune, and you could see the strings doing these amazing waves. And you see how these waves, they don't have, you don't need a string anymore. They're, the waves are everywhere. They're moving through our tissues of our bodies. They're everywhere. So, uh, you know, if you can send a certain, at a frequency, you can pulse something. You can affect uh, all sorts of things because everything in the body, including the endocrine system, the brain, tissues, muscles, etc. Everything has its own frequency. And so uh, it's not hard to see that if you can electrify the entire environment and set up, and, and, and to do that, you need instruments around that can keep tweaking the chemtrails, the heavy metals in the chemtrails, keep tweaking them so that they're constantly ionized, constantly active, then you can set up a world in which we are all part of that electric grid. We are part of what they love to call the hive mind. So say I'm living in Seattle and they want the city to uh, turn into a zombie uh, apocalypse. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so they, um, they spray some, some generous chemtrails they uh, they torch up uh, the uh, SBXs off coast. Those are uh, huge golf ball looking uh, radons. Uh, they t- they get them tweaked up, and um, now they begin to zap just just the air over us. They don't have to necessarily zap our brains because of cyclotron resonance. We're resonating with whatever that pulse is in our environment. We resonate. We, we're built that way. And, and so then suddenly um, those of lower consciousness, those of uh, sort of a little maybe a couple degrees above an animal um, uh, way of living through desire and um, aggression, et cetera, uh, it just takes them over. Mm-hmm. Just takes them over, and and now those of us who are not subject to it are, are now going to have to deal with it. So in that way, you can see how it could be used as a weapon. Yes, it could also just be that the the general uh, resonance being sent out uh, puts us into that hive mind and keeps us in it. We're feeling good. We've got this little margin of happiness now where we love to go to work, we love to do these boring uh, corporate jobs, we love to then go home and uh, stay in our home and not talk to any of our neighbors and not join groups and uh, we just turn on the boob tube and are fed our daily ration. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not hard to do a 1984 on this particular idea of the space fence. 
Well, now, I just want to talk a little bit about the elite, because you mentioned, obviously, you've done a lot of research and spent your whole life, in a sense, researching and studying the various groups and their brotherhoods, as you said, the, the esoteric aspects of ritual abuse, uh, mind control. What is it about the elite that is, is, this, is this a, psych, a sociopathic uh, gene, is it, or, that's, or is it passed on from gener generationally by a certain bloodline? Or how, what is it that drives their worldview? Well, I think it, it's all of those. Yeah, I think um, uh, I've had the opportunity to know a few el elites well and have um, inquired into their upbringings. And um, they don't have the same upbringing um, that a lot of people have. They, they, are, um, they are prepared to handle the reins of power. And I think the story that that Freemasons love is that story of, uh, oh, what is that Greek myth? Um, Helios uh, going through the sky uh, and uh, trying to uh, hold the horse's reins, mm. but getting too close to the sun and then and, and, and plummeting to the earth and, and dying. Um, this idea of... Um, Hubris. The elite seeing themselves as those who must handle the reins of Helios horses mm -hmm. uh, in in the in in the maintenance of power in the uh, f furthering of power. This is how they see it. So they toughen their kids. They, um, you know, many of their little girls are raped. Uh, usually by servants, and um, uh, there's mind control going on. They, they are sacrificed for the sake of the family's power. Um, I mean, I, I remember reading about uh, the DuPont fellow, uh, Eluthier uh, DuPont, who um, was taken with wrestling and had a wrestler living on his property, and eventually... Uh, murdered that wrestler in a fit of, uh, of uh, they made a really good film of it recently. Yeah, it but I had The Foxcatcher movie that came out the last Fox year. The Foxcatcher, yes. And I had read about that years before. And I thought the film was excellent, very well done. It really followed the storyline. Um, so, so they're not people to envy at all. And uh, when people sit around and grind their teeth over this, the elites running us and we're supposed to be free and et cetera, well, a lot of that freedom that we have had in America was experimental. And, uh, and you know, I certainly lived uh, in an era or grew up in an era, came of age in an era when there was plenty of money and you didn't need much money to to get just about anything. So I feel very fortunate in that that was not what I had to face uh, as a youth. But um, I think uh, we have all always been subject to elites. I don't know of any time in history that the common people uh, have, um, have not been subject. It's just that by living in America where we were part of a Freemason uh, experiment, the New Atlantis, uh, which is what um, uh, Sir Francis, uh, you know, this is this is what we are supposed to be in, and now it's being dismantled. Mm -hmm. It's being dismantled in in favor of the quote global village unquote. <laughs> That's what they used to call it. I, I, I would call it the global Guantanamo Bay, <laughs> um, and because now we're going to feel uh, our real position. Mm -hmm. And that's not all bad to, uh, to, you know, I'm all for busting up illusions. Uh, and, uh, and we still are a developed country. We, they haven't taken us down to the third level down. They are taking us to a second level. We're not going to be a first world country anymore. Uh, but we're still useful to the globalists for our military might. In fact, I would say that the military... Uh, unfortunately, I'm sad to say it, but it is probably a a primary um, holding us from at holding at bay, at falling lower, because it is it, it is uh, what is of use to the globalists. Um, so we're in, we're in a really fascinating period 
in which we now can see the uh, elite that have always ruled us. They've lost their gloss for most of us. We don't think of them as kings or princes. We now have every president who comes into office reveals himself to be a cad mm -hmm. and to not be worthy of our praise. And I think this is very intentional by the globalists to make sure that we do not uh, respect that office because at some point soon, and I think that this, uh, this climate change decision in Paris may actually be the Trojan horse by which um, the globalists are able to convince people that, wow, we really need global governance. Right. Look at what's happening to our climate. You know, we, we need someone to take the reins here like Helios. So, um, so that's probably what's going to happen. Certainly every election, well, almost every election uh, of a president since Kennedy has been fixed in some way. Uh, and, and then uh, the, uh, the emperor has no clothes, follows next. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, we can see now what the elite are and aren't. Uh, I find that to be really positive. Um, it may not feel good that our illusions are just falling one after the other, but this is how consciousness grows, yeah. is by uh, releasing your illusions and confronting your time. And I'm, you know, I'm a student of Rudolf Steiner. I'm very, um, I'm very committed to confronting my time. Why was I born now? What is it that I have to do here? Uh, and I, I want to do that. Yes. And there's, there's no doubt. So I find it to be very wakeful, and, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled. I mean, give me a good enemy, and I'm at my best. Well, that's, and that's the key. I think that's the beauty of this time period. There is this consciousness shift, this awareness, thanks, thanks to, in a sense, the grid of the, inter the Internet and the global awakening that is allowed by people being able to communicate more rapidly than ever before. And yet here we are challenged, as, you, as you're saying, by tremendous enemies who've planned this much longer than we've been alive. And yet you have to have some faith that we are here for a purpose. Yes. So yes. I, I think we should, uh, we'll have to conclude it for now, but I would love to get you back on once your, your book is completed. I think that's going to be a fascinating uh, journey into the space fence discussion. And we'll have much more to talk about in the future. Great, Sean, and I hope you I hope you get the book, uh, the Chemtrails Heart book, so that you at least have done step one, because then the space fence will make much more sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for joining us, Alana. We'll speak we'll speak with you again soon, hopefully. Thanks for having me, Sean. Absolutely. Bye. Well, not much more to add to that because you may not believe it, but wait and see what comes. The new world order does exist, whether or not it's fully in control or what stage of the game we are currently in, it's hard to say, but to s sort of write this off as the ramblings of insanity, I would urge you to rethink that, and if ultimately you decide that's your conclusion, as I said, you will see the world to come. This is Sean Stone signing off. <laughs>